Hi, HR Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. We've got a super exciting episode for you today. I'll be honest, I've been looking forward to this all week. So, super excited for this one. We're joined by Punit Dillon, who's a president, CEO, and chair of Sky Bioscience and author of Catapult, How to Think Like a Corporate Athlete to Strengthen Your Resilience. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Chris. Thanks so much for having me on your show. This it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. As I said, I've been looking forward to this all week. If I ever have an opportunity to talk about being an athlete and sports and entrepreneurship, then I'm pretty excited <laughs> uh, as well. But tell everyone a little bit more about your background personally uh, before we jump in and your journey to where we are now. Great. Well, uh, yeah, I started in biotech about uh, 20 years ago uh, in, uh, in Canada. I was working for a life science healthcare fund, um, one of the largest in Canada, and um, had an opportunity to move to the U.S. Uh, I worked for a, a, a company that's uh, now focused on DNA vaccines called Enofio Pharmaceuticals. Um, and uh, between those two companies really cut my teeth with a lot of different types of transactions, M&A, uh, 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 um, big uh, groups, um, uh, lots of diff different uh, uh, territories and uh, even, uh, even even some large licensing deals. Uh, in 2011, um, between 2010 and 2011, I started my own company. Um, I co-founded a biotech company that's, that was pioneering uh, new technologies in, um, in targeting cancer and uh, led that to be listed on NASDAQ. Um, and uh, it's now um, uh, final in its final stage for melanoma uh, for melanoma drug and it, uh, that uh, program is still underway. Um, led a, a, a partnership with Merck on on that on that program, uh, and then uh, today I'm uh, focused on Sky. Uh, and Sky's mission is um, uh, is pretty broad. Uh, our lead program uh, is um, is in glaucoma. It's in it's in the leading cause of it's the leading cause of blindness around the world. And uh, we're developing a whole whole new class of medicines based on uh, this very interesting area of cannabinoid science. And um, it is potential to treat glaucoma as well as uh, wide spectrum of other diseases. Amazing, amazing. I don't even know where to start on that. <laughs> uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Take us back a bit further though, before beforehand. You know what inspired you to get into this space, and obviously the book. Um, you know, you talk about being a corporate athlete. I know a lot of what happened in your your childhood, and your experience as well, kind of defined a lot of the work that you do, right? Yeah, thanks for touching on that, and I'm glad to have a chance to hear about yours as well. So I, I think I can have uh, many parallels to, to your own experience. Um, grew up in Vancouver. Uh, uh, actually, was uh, born in Vancouver, but I was raised in India uh, uh, with uh, from um, my grandparents. Um, my parents were still in school when they had me as a child, so uh, they shipped me off to, um, to, to be raised by my grandparents. Uh, nonetheless, uh, coming back uh, and, and growing up, uh, from the age of five in East Vancouver, um, it was quite quite an experience. Um, so there's, uh, um, I think uh, we definitely understand and recognize the the, the values that um, our parents uh, instill in us as immigrants and and um, that hard work ethic. Uh, I've, um, I've I've been very um, fortunate, I think, to to have a lot of different exposure. I grew up competitively swimming. Um, my dad was a, a happened to be a, a, a swimmer himself and also um, uh, 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 involved in track and in basketball. So he was quite uh, athletic. Uh, he kept uh, kept us pretty uh, uh, busy, my brother and I, and um, got into running. And then uh, eventually um, uh, my father put me into uh, competitive swimming. So we uh, enjoyed that and I and, uh, was very thankful for kind of the community around uh, that, that unique environment. And then um, I, I did uh, competitive swimming throughout high school and into university. And then I went into uh, uh, competitive rowing. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have some of that, those experiences. I think um, uh, that really allowed me to think about uh, this aspect of um, athletics that is captured in Catapult. Um, I, I think, um, you know, if I look back in the first, uh, my first part of my, my life, all of this, uh, 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 these different experiences and different hardship, um, 
uh, definitely catalyzed a, a lot of um, uh, desire uh, to do well in everything that we we apply ourselves in. So the, the the rationale for kind of writing Catapult was the ability to reflect on both of those aspects of uh, being an, an entrepreneur and some of the interesting experiences that shaped that as well as being an athlete um, and the training and the approach that you take in the top level of any sport. Um, and I've been lucky that in, in my adult life, I've um, continued to stay athletic. I still compete in triathlons and swims and runs and whatever, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I stay pretty active. Um, so the, this, this notion of a corporate athlete, which has actually been around uh, for some time, um, but I wanted to kind of bring it back into uh, a, a, um, a kind of a, a new place, uh, yeah. or a new understanding for, for, for everyone. And there's a lot of similarities in terms of behavior between uh, the, the idea of, of being an athlete as well as a corporate athlete and kind of you, you face this uh, realization mm -hmm. in any theme that you're trying to pursue or if you're trying to push through to have new innovations or you're trying to uh, get to the top of uh, any uh, top of anything just like uh, an athlete uh, is always interested in continuing to better themselves. Yeah. Do you, do, do, you, do you have to be an athlete then from a sports perspective to be a corporate athlete? I, absolutely not. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that that's the, the great thing about um, entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, everyone always likes to compare uh, entrepreneurship as not, uh, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, that's a great analogy because it, it's never ending. I, I want to take that further and say that there's no finish line in entrepreneurship. You know, and that's what people don't get though right like when i try to explain that to friends they're like when's enough enough <laughs> and i'm like that's the thing and that like you know is never enough is never enough you know when i and i thought i didn't know that going in if i'm being honest you know we had you know when we were young we grew up pretty poor we're like oh when we make that first million that's it everything's amazing and like as you start growing and getting to those you know hitting those goals you're like you, you should always want more there's like no finish line <laughs> um and that's kind of what keeps you going like for me it's the journey which is the exciting part sometimes actually when we hit goals i'm like oh okay <laughs> right it's actually the grind of getting there and everything learning the failures and just everything that goes into that for me that's the most exciting thing and the same and, and that's the same for me with sports so Growing up, uh, Shane and I, my co-founder, our friends and family members would always say, why don't you just stick to one thing? You know, why do you play tennis, ice hockey, skating, dancing? And because what we would do is we'll get to a level of mastery in a particular sport and we, and we would get bored because we would yeah. become very, very talented at a particular thing. And we're like, okay, what's next? And a lot of people didn't understand that. We're like, and we couldn't even understand why we were getting, because I was like, what if, what if I just stuck to that one sport? I wonder where I would be right now as opposed to going across so it's, it really is all about the journey yeah and, and i think like in order for us to make um, uh, uh, meaningful progress in any work or anything that you do uh, you need to have passion behind it um so i think that this is the important thing about um i i don't i don't believe in there's a balance uh, really there's a um, in the book we just kind of I described this as an aspect of joy between work, self, and life. And, um, and there's, there's no proverbial um, uh, even, even ground between any of those uh, three areas. Um, you have to um, adapt and, and continue to uh, feel you know, where, where you can make the most uh, um, uh, progress. Uh, and the only way that's going to happen is if you're, if, you're, um, uh, if you're passionate about and, and mean passionate around meaningful work that you do. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that really stems from some of the, the personal work that you do. So athletics is, is a great example of um, demonstrating like to yourself that accountability when you, when you make an achievement or you better your time or you're improving, improving yourself in, in work, um, you also need those win wins on a constant basis. Um, sometimes they're small wins, but you know, I think that um, that each of those wins really counts towards uh, demonstrating to yourself that level of same accountability for progress and making sure that um, uh, it, that in order to achieve that, it has to be meaningful. And mm -hmm. and if you 
do it well in the work, I believe it translates into other parts of your life really well. Yeah, and vice versa. Um, yeah. did, did you realize uh, when you went into the corporate world how valuable your experience and background with sports and how, did you did you understand the, how transferable some of those skills were and the impact they would have? I, I think, you know, and tangentially, like all of us, we all, you know, we, we look at, you're only kind of as good as your, your experience, right? So uh, I, I definitely leaned on athleticism or, or, or experience um, in the different sports that I've done, teams and stuff like that, uh, and, and applied that into, into work. But I don't, I don't think I took a, I really took a hard look at that and, <laughs> until like the last two years, really reflecting on what exactly do I believe in, in terms of those principles that I learned from, from sports uh, that, that happened. So, so one regard, I think it happened organically yeah. in terms of certain things. And then you take a, take stock of it and you're like, okay, these are the things that I, I believe that are really the, the key drivers that mm -hmm. that can probably benefit um, a lot of people. And the biggest kind of realization for me was you look at um, professional athletes, right? Professional athletes, they, they focus on their professional sport for 10, 15, 20 years. And then they also adapt or, or, or pivot to kind of their next career. Some of them become successful entrepreneurs, others, you know, um, give back to the sport in some, some other way. I think, um, uh, nonetheless, we learned in terms of how they, how they've been able to really apply themselves and focus and then take that experience and then pivot to another, another place. I think that, that corporate athletes are, are no different, but I, be, I believe that corporate athletes don't give themselves enough credit for, um, the same type of, uh, routine and same type of uh, uh, expectations that professional athletes would give themselves. So take, for example, you know, a professional athlete, they have an off season, off season when they're on in their off season, they, they focus on other things, you know, in, in, a, in, a, as a corporate athlete, same thing, you know, um, you should take a vacation, not make it a working vacation. If you come back rejuvenated, you come back, really a hundred percent and you're able to give a hundred percent um uh, uh professional athletes they have a um um you know they have a off-season train uh, off-season training or or a training camp uh same thing uh you know in terms of corporate athlete we have off sites those are very focused opportunities to get to dive into your business to really uh, hone in on particular skills and then apply it back to uh, your work experience so there, there are these kind of very similar parallels, but what if we double down on, on some of those things and take them even to the next level in terms of design your next offsite to really um, hone in on particular skills that can sharpen a manager or sharpen a, a decision maker's mm -hmm. ability to make that critical decision when it really counts, just like we expect somebody to make a free throw. And I think uh, one of the areas we can definitely improve is the same way that in sports we have, you know, coaches and we have uh, psychologists that we see. But in the workplace, a lot of that's missing, you know. Um, you know why, why would we not, as a CEO or founder operating in a company, to be at the top of your game, both physically and mentally? So in, in the sports world, it's very common for an athlete to have a psychologist, a therapist, and a nutritionist, you know, strength and, strength and conditioning coach, et cetera. But in the corporate world, we don't have that. We don't look at it the same way. Also, and sometimes there's also a stigma attached um, to, to having, for example, a therapist as a CEO or a founder. Yet that's an area which for me personally it, um, is something I need to work on and, and, and to be at the top of my game. Uh, yeah. And that, 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 did, that did shock me when I first came into the corporate world, having had so many coaches in different sports to walk into a company that had no, no training and development department, no one coaching people. And I was like looking around, we're like, who's, where's my coach? <laughs> where's my coach to teach me to be the best salesperson <laughs> that I can be. And it was quite strange, uh, not to have that. And then I, I just kind of naturally was like, who's the best here 
and let me go sit next to them <laughs> and just consume as much as I can uh, from them. And um, to, to the question I asked you, I was, I didn't realize I was very uh, ac accidental in terms of the translation of the skill set into the corporate world. But I was really, what I couldn't understand is why people around me were giving up so quickly when they had rejection or, uh, or you know, a client said no, you know, they'll take it personal. And I realized that a lot of people around me had never faced rejection before. Mm -hmm. They have never failed. They have never left an ice hockey game that you've trained all, all, all week for and lost and gone home on the bus where everyone's you know, upset. Or even as kids, I remember me and Shane would be crying. <laughs> when we, we lost an ice hockey game, we'd cry as kids. They'd be like, oh, <laughs> so I was upset. And, uh, or growing up in a poor area of East London where with a single parent, four kids, that we didn't even know if we were going to have food that day so the level of resilience was so high from sports and our background and upbringing and everything we experienced that when i got into the corporate world i realized wow we're, there's a big difference here to our level of resilience compared to some of our peers who have come from highly educated backgrounds and never had to go without anything and i was like wow this is actually a really big strength <laughs> of us that we we can deal with this <laughs> Hundred percent. I think um, you're absolutely right, and and to the point on, on the coaching. You know, before you can even benefit from a coach um, being able to offer you uh, help, you know, you have to put your ego aside. And I don't think a lot of people um, uh, gonna make that necessary connection. You 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 did as an athlete. You recognize how uh, a coach um, uh, can allow you to you know. Have a plan, prepare, uh, elevate uh, your game uh, on the ice or in in the, in the workplace. The same thing applies. So, I think that uh, a lot of people um, have this stigma associated with it in terms of uh, coaching or or um, but you have to let your guard down, really open up, um, and in order to grow as an individual and before you can effectively lead a team, you uh, you have to be open minded in terms of how. Uh, um, uh, a coach can help uh, can exceed your own expectations mm -hmm. because this resilience thing is a is a critical thing. Is um, I think uh, a, a lot of people do give up and sometimes they give up too soon um, and and they don't um, you know aside from thinking about contingency plans and stuff like that. I think this aspect of being able to bounce back quickly if you fall down. How fast can you quickly get back up again and finish that race? You know, how many times have we seen um, that underdog story in, in terms of that come that comeback, right? Um, uh, it, it, I think that um, that's what uh, coaches can really help uh, in terms of that guidance um, because they allow athletes, corporate athletes, to stretch beyond their comfort zone. And once you get outside of your, your comfort zone, all of a sudden you're, you're hitting those, those new barriers. So mm -hmm. guidance allows you to learn through other people's experiences, both on the failures and on the successes and enables us to improve in huge leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that you can build mental toughness as a, as a muscle? That's a great question. I think I touched on this in the, in the book um, um, uh, briefly. Um, I, I think that, a lot of people. Um, uh, let's come. Let's let's come back to that qu question. I, <laughs> I, I want to gather my thoughts around that. No, because I, I asked you that because I, when I first became a manager, it's something that I would get kind of stressed out about sometimes because it's like yeah. in my team, it's like kids as well. I've got a daughter that's uh, you know just about to turn three, and I I'm almost worried that if she doesn't experience. <laughs> if she you know she doesn't experience heartbreak or failure that it will be detrimental because i understand the value of you know not having anything and having to go the hard route and that's kind of led to where i am now and and i wouldn't be here to you know the company recently we had you know the, the pandemic almost kind of lost the business and it's just that that as you said when you get knocked down that beat just to get up and keep going and, and actually enjoy it even though 
it's, it doesn't feel great at the time whenever I'm in that situation. Sometimes me and Shane even get, we're worried sometimes that things are going too well <laughs> and too smoothly because that means we're not stretching ourselves. We're not pushing uh, far enough. There is a balance, by the way. It can go, you can go too far, which we have, and that, and that causes anxiety and, and, and other things as well. But how do we instill that in our kids or our, or our, or our, our colleagues and our peers without it being... You know, do you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that, yeah, to, to some extent that's, that success kind of does um, hinge on a certain amount of risk and you can't, can't live without taking that risk. But uh, so it does demand this mental toughness and the confidence that comes from kind of looking inward. But um, I, I think that you, entrepreneurs, you know, have, and anyone for that matter, you know, it has to think beyond um, uh, the phys physically, right? And uh, in, they have to emotionally invest in themselves first in order to really prepare for some of the un unavoidable challenges that come come with everything. So I think, I think in order to really build mental toughness, you, we have to uh, require reflection and introspection and then just the time and effort associated with it. I was um, talking to a friend um, uh, last week. Uh, it, it's his first um, uh, half Ironman, and uh, we've been we've been he's he lives on the east coast. I'm on the west coast, so we've we've been um, uh, doing the best we can, kind of help each other with training and and um, and it's his first race. It's his first big race, and um, so of course you know he's a bit bit nervous because this is the the largest race that he's done. Um, and he called me last week and just asking kind of some of the basic questions and and I I, I was opened completely transparent and said you know one one of the uh, things I told him to do is just first of all, just take a deep breath and visualize visualize yourself through each of these different parts that you're thinking are going to be challenging because I want you to spend the time to think about that transition from swim to bike that transition from bike to run, but also think about that anxiety feeling that you're probably going to get when you jump in the water with all those people and that heart racing feeling that you're going to get running out of the water, going and trying to find your bike. Those are natural feelings in each of these situations. Um, and the only way we can you know, prepare ourselves is take the time to be introspective and really um, to reflect. I did a race this last weekend. I hadn't done an open water or swim event in, in years, in two years, and it was it was I I got that anxiety feeling again. <laughs> and at one on one regard, I was like, oh man, I missed this, I missed this feeling. But on the other side, I was like, oh, am I gonna survive? Like, it immediately puts you into survival mode. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I I don't have a choice. I gotta I gotta I I'm not gonna <laughs> die doing this. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna come out on the other end. Uh, lo and yeah. behold, I got my best time that I've ever done, you know, <laughs> and so I was like something, some adrenaline was definitely pumping uh, that day. Yeah, uh, you are right though, but the more you you experience that anxiety and that feeling, like the pre-game jitters is kind of what people talk about, right? Yeah, yeah. If you, you, like anything, the more you expose yourself to it, you can operate in that, at that, in that, at that, at that level, you know, and, and if you go away for a long time and come back, it's tough <laughs> and you yeah. got and you got to, like I, I i didn't go to gym to the gym for a long while i was pretty pretty bad during the pandemic one because they were closed and i was just struggling yeah. to i was kind of bored with the whole at home workout so it just kind of yeah. wasn't i wasn't excited about it and when i got back in the gym i tried to go to the same <laughs> weights to the same harder then all of a sudden i was like well i was dizzy and hyperventilating and i was like to my wife i was like i feel like i'm gonna pass out <laughs> And I was, I was like, okay, I need to reset and realize I need to start again and build back up um, uh, to, to where I was before. But yeah, it's uh, it doesn't feel good. That's the thing. But most of the most magical things happen is uh, like, you know, when you're running and you have that burning sensation in your lungs, like um, when, especially when we played hockey, it feels horrible. But you, when, you, when, you, it's, when you get it, you feel good. It's weird to explain to people. Or when I get back from the gym and the next day my muscles are so sore, 
and I can't move. I'm like, yes, <laughs> which is so weird because you're like in so much pain, but you're like, yeah, it feels good. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think that, like you know, the, the coach, the coach aspect is interesting because you know your coach must have told you this. There's there's those days where you just don't want to train. You're not feeling a hundred percent, but you remember those conversations where the coach says to you, like, these are the days when it really counts. Right? It's true. And those words always come up all the time. Whenever I'm feeling like, hey, there's a little bit, I'm a little bit off. I'm like, these are the days that really counts. And it must reward in mentally as well, because when you do end up going, for example, to the gym or going and training on that day, when you yeah. leave, you feel a million dollars. You're just like, yeah, I did it. Like, I didn't want to go. And and mo- most of the time, when you finally, when you get in there, when you get out, you feel amazing. The endorphins are running, rushing through. You feel great. And and you personally, mentally, it's like, yeah, I did that. I know I didn't want to go. Didn't feel like it, but I still did it. And that yeah. just builds even more positive habits uh, to, to be able to do it um, as well. You, in the book, you mentioned, you know, 10 principles. I'm not going to ask you to go through all of those. But, you know, if you had to choose kind of three of those principles what would they be and why um so i think that the the in chapter six we talk about this aspect of uh vista uh which is basically take a taking a a, a, a broader view of of um of yourself like uh go go beyond um sorry just like take our vantage point of view um so some, basically, I'm sorry, I mean to say that you, you have to take a step back and take a beat, and like a breath, like, uh, and, and a better look. Um, so that's that's a very important one. I think all of us are always moving so fast. Sometimes you're just focused on yourself uh, and you don't take a, take a measure in terms of paying attention to the little details and, and also recognizing kind of what's around you. Um, that, that's applicable to sport it's applicable to training it's applicable to the workplace it's a, it's applicable to everything i think the other important uh thing is just uh, uh just having this aspect of radical open-mindedness um i think leadership is uh is is an action it's not some sort of state of being it doesn't um uh, preclude you from really setting aside your ego and asking the questions or consulting others in order to reach your goals, just like we talked about in coaching. Get the help, and and in order to lead effectively, it's not about you at all. It's about understanding the, how you're doing something and how it's impacting others. And there's a, a really a, um, a huge humility, I think, that will ultimately help you as a leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, it's this, uh, this idea that um, uh, you don't have to be the smartest, fastest, most creative, innovative person in the room or it, it's, uh, it's really recognizing that you can learn from others uh, in, in the room and there's a lot of dynamic people around you. I learned that uh, with a wonderful community that I, uh, that I, that I grew up with, um, uh, friends, family. Um, my, my, my swim mates, uh, every one of them, um, uh, you know, I'm so impressed. This little, um, community center uh, based out of uh, East Vancouver produced, um, some wonderful people that are doing some amazing things around the world. Um, uh, so my mates that, that I swam with, uh, they're all top of their field. You know, one is running a some billion dollar fund in, in Hong Kong, others are partner at, at, at big four accounting firms. Um, I'm, I'm very, very impressed uh, with like, uh, just in terms of that camaraderie and we still all talk to each other. Uh, so there's this fraternity for life that um, kind of recognize that where you came from and, and that it's not about you, it's about how you supported one another mm-hmm. uh, and you continue to support one another. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and then I think if you, you ask for three, there's there's a lot, um, <laughs> uh, but I I think that one uh, there's some obvious ones that we already talked about, but I think one if I think outside the box a bit, there's a, this aspect of finding your stride. So um, in in you played professional hockey, um, you, you know you understand um, what it takes to get on the ice and what that feeling is when you when you when you have that glide um uh, uh, with 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 your skates on and that puck control uh and in one aspect you never lose it uh at playing at an elite level like you played 
but at the same time you, if you if you're not practicing on a regular basis you lose that touch that that special finesse i'm with you let me give an example so i haven't skateboarded in 15 years yeah. and recently i came out of the office and there was a group there was a bunch of kids outside in the car park skating and i was like i have to have a go i have to have a go <laughs> so so i went over to these kids and i probably way double the, you know the weight i used to do when i used to skateboard and i could still you know do a kickflip and a heel flip and a few up which i was amazed i was like how i still have the muscle memory because to learn how to kickflip probably took yeah. me a thousand attempts yeah and uh if anyone who tried skateboarding it's probably one of the most difficult things i've ever tried to do and i can still do it but to your point it wasn't the level of precision and uh you know the the um the way my body obviously what i was in physical shape <laughs> to yeah. to do it the pop wasn't as, sh as sharp but you kind of never you never forget it but you're right because i haven't done it in 15 years <laughs> it doesn't it yeah. isn't i'm not I'm definitely not in a stride <laughs> put it that way yeah so like i think it's exactly it like in, you know in from from now like you know we're not we're not elite athletes anymore but no. we have our day jobs but but so today in terms of the application the, the mechanical day-to-day -day repetitions like they can feel like they really don't serve a purpose but but those exquisite rituals that you remember from that pop kick or sorry i'm kick flip. The, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> the quick but uh the <laughs> it's all right no worries <laughs> yeah but basically uh, those those types of rit rituals really help you in in getting that feeling in different things that you're doing right mm -hmm. so the small victories they add up to that same greatness that you felt um when you if, when you were able to do it as a child yeah it's pretty amazing though even after that many years that immediately when i put my foot on the board my feet went into the exact placement that you should put your feet in to do a kickflip so if we're on, a, if we're on a skateboard, for anyone who doesn't skateboard, for every move, you have your feet are in a different position on the board in order to make that happen. And the fact that even I didn't even think about it, and as soon as I stood on the board, my front foot went here and my back foot went here, and it was the exact angle that it should be because I just did it so many times years and years ago that my brain, it's incredible how it can remember it. And like, like you said, it all, you know, even ice, you know, ice skating, you, know, you can never forget really how to ice skate again or rollerblade or any of these things and it's interesting when you see someone learning it for the first time on the ice and even though you haven't done it in 15 years you can jump straight on and go it's yeah. pretty incredible um yeah. and you find those same flow states in business as well and those oh, yeah. same and uh, yeah <laughs> that, so that finding your stride you know is, is i think is is applicable across the board and we can always look back to when you run or when you swim, that catch in the water. Think about a dress rehearsal. The dress rehearsal is never as polished as the live performance, but one comes out of the other, right? And so what you basically you putting into, into, into your life or what you put into things, that's what you get out of it. So I think that, that um, there's, a, there's always a lot of blood, sweat and tears our day-to-day -day and, and it's about finding those moments in order to recognize that hey this is this is not just mechanical day-to-day -day repetition this is something that's making me really good at what i do and this mm -hmm. is you know why you're doing this wonderful um thing in terms of your current business and spreading this amazing um message about the importance of hr leaders yeah that's something i struggle with though in business to be honest is like is to what the things that we do well, how do we capture that and create a process around it <laughs> so we can be consistent and keep doing it. So those moments when we do something amazing is like, and sometimes I don't even know I'm doing it and you people may not even know that that's something they're doing, which is equal in this success. And how do we bottle that up and create a process and, and replicate that success? And, yeah. and, and I was very good at doing that in sports and in business, I didn't, so when we started a company with just me and Shane, we realized as we started hiring people it was like how do we get that information out of chris's head <laughs> and shane's head and 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 you know and, and spread it across the business and create processes around it and because we didn't we don't know what we're doing we're just doing it because we just know that it works if that makes sense and yeah. trying to create principles and processes around that was something that we really struggled with early on and we still do uh, as we scale the company um as well <laughs> so yeah so in business they call it the standard operating procedure so you're just going to have to sit there and meticulously document how you do things and then tell them 
you know, then some, then your, your next in command saying, this is how I'd like it done. Yeah, I remember the first time I experienced that is when I became, um, I was a very successful salesperson who just all of a sudden was given this managerial job. It was like, oh, you're good at sales, you can be a manager, which we all know is not the case <laughs> in many cases as well. And um, a lot of the team would ask me, you know, how do you get those sales? What are you doing? And I couldn't really answer. I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing, just working. I just know it's working. And I remember Zach, who was on my team, over the course of a few weeks, I didn't even know this, he would listen to me on the calls when I was pitching clients and he started writing down all the things I've been doing without telling anyone. And then he came back to me like a few weeks later and he said, here's your script. And I was like, what? And he goes, here's exactly what you do and say in these scenarios and here's what you say to a customer. And from that moment onwards, that actually became the playbook for the team of how we sell and we became super successful as a team. But he managed to take what was in my head and what I was saying and, and define it and put it in a process on paper. And it was pretty amazing. Uh, even, you know, probably 10 years later, we're still using elements of that. Um, that's great. As well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the thing. So you guys recognize, you know, the, the importance of what works really well and you continue to adapt um, and continue to make sure through that. That's how great teams become successful, right? They're, they're not using the same playbook year year after year they're continuing to refine adapt, yeah but they also have but they have their core mm -hmm. principles that sets them apart you know like look at the bulls team um chicago bulls during um uh, uh during the six championships uh, they, they were an incredible incre incredible team like they had um uh, certain things that they really believed in um mm -hmm. so sorry so we're going we're we're pro uh, we're probably going off tangent now. <laughs> no worries. Well, why write this book now, though? You know, in, in your <laughs> in your career, obviously you've done incredible things. You've built and sold your first business. I think that's what you said earlier. You now, obviously, and you're tackling some of the biggest challenges that we that we face as as you know, cancer and everything else. So, wh where where when do we? Oh, I'm going to write this book. Where did that kind of <laughs> come into yeah, play? So uh, two parts to that. One, one is that I was going through a kind of a personal milestone in my life as well. And I, I basically, um, you know, a, a, approaching 40. So yeah, everyone kind of has that reflective <laughs> period. I think when you turn, turn that age and you're like, okay, well, what, what have I, what have I learned? I actually asked myself that question. It's like, I've been working like my ass off for this many years. What, what have I taken away? And, and am I going to be doing the same thing for the next 20 years? Like if I had a certain trajectory that I feel very um, happy with for this first half, like where, where does, where does this go next? But then, um, you know, beyond thinking along those lines, I also was thinking about, well, okay. Um, what can I, what could I learn? What could I have done differently? If somebody, if I knew what I know now, like, you you know how every year we get more mature and then we always look back like, wow, yeah, I'm I with you. that last year. <laughs> yeah. And it always seems easy, like, because uh, I'll talk to my, friend, my friends who are, don't own their own companies about how we do things and it, I make it sound really easy and it's like, I, but I didn't know any of this stuff before. So they're like, yeah. Chris, yeah, but you already know that. That's why. So I'm like, yeah, that's true, actually. I had to go for yeah, a lot yeah. of experiences and things to get where I am now <laughs> um, as well. You're right. There's a lot of mistakes and made a lot. I don't think I would take change it, though, because I feel like those are what defined me, those moments and those fit. We've made some terrible mistakes as founders <laughs> along the way. But to be honest, I feel like it's what led to where we are now and the breakthroughs and everything else. Exactly. And that's the same way I feel as well. It's just the, the only thing uh, that you kind of take away from all that is like, okay, would there have been different places where maybe you put your gas pedal down a bit more, or maybe you take the gas pedal off. So the, the part that I kind of was reflecting on is that um, what, what, what are those uh, things that I would have told myself if I started my career all over again? Yeah. And, and, and what, like basically, so it, it, this was an opportunity to really guide that this next generation, uh, if they're interested, if, uh, you know, and make it relatable, um, you know, fresh out of university, you, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, students are athletes. Um, how do you, uh, you know, jump into the world of, um, 
of uh, the work or the work sorry the workforce uh, but at the same time sometimes you don't even know you know what you want to do um, so help you find your help people identify what their purpose give them a framework in terms of here's of some large problems on this planet um, you know that extend uh, beyond the obvious you know uh, I've, I've outlined in chapter 10 or principle 10 uh, uh, the importance of education technology life sciences AI and the environment as a very critical areas where uh, people can participate and make change um, but coming back to this it was it was, uh, it was really an opportunity to um, hold myself accountable to what my beliefs are going forward into into my next part of my into the next part of my life which I think that uh, I was on a psych bike ride with a friend a few weeks back and we were talking about this is like uh, when I when I moved to San Diego I came from East Vancouver you know we had a rainy um, horrible weather 90% of the year I got a chance to live on on the beach uh, when I moved to San Diego and it was beautiful like uh, right across the street is one of the premier surf spots in the world like the pro most professional uh, sorry the, the like professional surfers they, they they practice there on wind and sea beach I would come home um, late from work you know uh, completely like kind of oblivious to, to the surroundings around me um, never really got into to into surfing and and now I enjoy it I, I spend a lot more time on the water uh, ironically but I was like if I if I wasn't so concerned about putting in the long hours at work and took a moment uh, you know to take advantage of that time of uh, would it have really affected where I am today? Maybe, maybe it might have made me a little bit more mellow as, a, <laughs> as a, as an individual, right? Like, yeah. you know, I, I think that there's just so, so many different things that we could. So, so I, I hold myself to um, kind of the, that responsibility of continuing to um, share experiences. Um, I learned. I'm very blessed to have the experiences with these different people. That I've come across in my career and that given me these different opportunities and you know continue to work um, uh, with amazing teams um, if we can share that experience uh, with others I think that you're we're only enabling uh, other people to be inspired by uh, making their own differences that they can yeah and that's why I was one of the reasons I was also sort of excited to speak to you because I know at a young age if I had a book like this uh, with these 10 principles i uh, it does it did intrigue me that where would i be what <laughs> what, and what what would that look like because i kind of learned like many people the hard way <laughs> of yeah, just yeah. experience just enough. yeah just going just go for, just go for it and see what happens and don't, don't get me wrong it was great i learned a lot you know good the bad the ugly <laughs> uh and i was like why do i choose to be an entrepreneur again <laughs> to be able to be able to do this but um i wouldn't have it any other way if i look back i think it was great but i do think it's great early on and that many more many people that perhaps met that 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 did give up maybe they, maybe they wouldn't have if they if they had these had this support and this advice um i was quite lucky that i was just my Shane definitely kept we kept held each other accountable and we picked each other I think as having a co-founder was a big part of it I definitely don't think I could have done this on my own if I'm, if I'm being honest there's been times I wanted yeah. to give up and Shane's been there to be like come on we can do this and vice versa and I feel like because we experienced so much failure and and not having anything growing up I think that was a massive part of it because we're like really you're complaining about this Chris you know remembering the fact that you know my mum used to get loans out just so we could have christmas yeah you know to get a, you know <laughs> and i and i yeah. found out only found out when i was a kind of teenager that well we had this huge amount of debt as a family i'm like where's all this debt come from and it was oh my mum getting loans just so we could have christmas dinner i'm like i'm like wow so those you know those rollerblades you bought me you basically took a loan out just so i wouldn't go without so like you know this is a context right you know <laughs> so when people are complaining about things i'm like really <laughs> we should come on chris get yourself together you're complaining about this <laughs> so um as well so yeah hey, i can 100 percent relate to that so that's 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 yeah it's, it's just incredible in terms of how you know we're really blessed with having that experience um to to be able to share that and then you, you yeah you you have the ability to bounce back and then unfortunately 
you do, um, you know, also have this kind of you, you're, you're you're scarred or whatever from that those experiences. It's good so, and bad, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it makes it hard to relate to data. Like, like I have this conversation with my kids. Like, my wife and I always ask it because we 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 grew up with the same kind of hardship that you're talking about, and now you know you're providing for your family it's it's all it's all dif- it's different right that's, like that's what i'm worried about i'm like i don't want yeah. Robin to have not i said i don't want her to have a great life <laughs> but yeah. i'm like I, i'm like i want her to experience failure because i understand the value of it but i'm not going to like as a parent seeing my daughter cry <laughs> or go yeah. through hardship but i also understand how valuable it is because and at some point now. say again yeah. like it's almost like you have to adapt to the current times as well like we need to have an evolution but how do you instill that same those same values and hardship? And it might not be financially. It could be you know other ways to instill. instill. Well, I want to get into into some sports. So that's how I like. And one way we can do that in a very positive way is is, is introducing her to different sports. So obviously, not going to try and drive her down an era I want, but I feel that's a good yeah. way for kids is just to experience that through competitive sports um, as well. And I, I, I it's, it's so valuable. Anyone. All of my friends that have played high level sports have all very vast majority have gone on to be super successful in anything. Like you said with your friends and what and what they want to do. And I can see the direct correlation between them being a high level athlete and then going and starting a company or just being the best that they can be in their jobs. Whatever they were doing, they're like they, they, it's very translatable transferable. So I definitely would love to encourage her to do that. But I don't want to be one of those parents is like <laughs> They're kind of pushing things on my kid, like do this sport, do that sport. I kind of just want to introduce, you know, you choose what you want to do. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine too um, as well. But it's going to be super interesting. What, yeah. what, what keeps you going? Obviously, you, you, you said you sold your last business, right? No, I didn't. So we didn't oh, sorry. We, we, did, we, did a, we did a partnership with uh, Big Pharma uh, for the lead program. Um, so that program is still underway, um, but I, I've, I've exited from that business and I'm focused on, on Sky. Uh, mm-hmm. So that 100% of my time is, is devoted towards this company. Uh, but that that's definitely keeps me going. Um, we're, we've got a pretty big mission ahead of us. Um, I'll tell you, just I'll spend 30 seconds to explain kind of why. I, um, uh, in in my last experience, I got a really good uh, opportunity to see what was happening in in cancer in the in the whole paradigm of cancer care. And if anyone that has experienced cancer or been a caregiver, you know we we know how devastating that disease has uh, has been. Um, so uh, we got an opportunity to push uh, forward a technology uh, that was in this area of cancer, called cancer immunotherapy. And when we started that company, there was very little drugs uh, approved in cancer immunotherapy. There was only one drug approved by Bristol Myers. And in the period of 10 years, that entire landscape shifted. And all of a sudden, you know, you have 90% of cancer being treated with ca- uh, cancer immunotherapy drugs. And our drug, incidentally, helps those patients that are non-responders to those, uh, to those different types of immunotherapies or certain types uh, become responders. So they make your immune cells more um, immunogenic and, and, and have a high response rate. Uh, in this, in this particular company that I'm working at for now, um, I saw a similar opportunity in terms of here's a technology that has wide applications across many different therapeutic areas. It's not just cancer. Okay. Here we're looking at metabolic disorders, central nervous system disorders, uh, ocular indications, you name it, there's a, there's an application, but um, there's still a long ways to go. So there's a couple trends happening. Big Pharma is very interested in uh, first-in-class molecules uh, because uh, of intellectual property and, and seeing if there's differentiation with these new types of molecules. And then you have applicability across all these different therapeutic areas. So I, I believe that we're on the cusp of something pretty large in terms of uh, we, we, we have this nice slogan called sky is the limit. And it, there really is uh, uh, um, no limit to the different types of application of our molecules. So we're uh, quite excited, uh, quite excited about what can happen over the next five years and, and decade uh, in terms of the entire space. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I've always been very keen on 
these challenging areas. Like they, the challenging thing about us is we're a preclinical company. We have a long way to go, uh, but you you know you have to develop you have to develop the molecule. You have to generate the data. You have to show efficacy. You have to show safety, and and that's part of the the roadmap. Uh, and you have to execute against that roadmap. So I I think there's some there's definitely those that a lot of uh, intrinsic motivation that comes along with uh, some 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 big goals uh, like that. Yeah, this is your your uh, your business version of Iron Man. It's a long way to go. <laughs> it's a long yeah. it's a long road, right? Yeah. And it's not going to be easy <laughs> uh, as well. But what an incredible reason to get out of bed every day. As yeah. uh, you know, you were talking about the why, the purpose, what, and that's what keeps you going you know during those tough times and the moments you want to give up if you have a strong why purpose that, that's what keeps you going um as well as incredible but before i let you go um if there's someone kind of new on their entrepreneurial journey you know what what advice would you give to them i'm sure so many people ask you <laughs> that question but i love to <laughs> to hear it I, I i start i start off with this book um with this aspect of um the per- first principle is called true accountability it was very deliberate in terms of why if um it's a couple of people that have read the book now and reached out um they've actually mentioned they like the flow of the of the way the content comes because you could you could read every principle on its own mm-hmm. but if you read it from cover to cover you kind of so you're as intentional so one to ten was intentional the order you put it in yeah okay exactly and so the first one is the, the most important and it's about uh just accountability starts with yourself and that is really focused on authenticity of being yourself um i don't like this idea of faking it till you make it um this 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 connotation that people you know um just uh are doing things that um to get to get somewhere to get ahead i think that it starts with yourself and you you if you just be yourself um that natural passion, the the purpose that you have, that drive, you 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 just gotta help um, feed it. And once you're feeding that, that accountability and that authenticity continues to grow, and you're gonna be uh, you know feeding your own expectations. Mm-hmm. So, as any entrepreneur, any individual, anybody that's starting the workplace, I think it just starts with that mentality and that mindset and you know you made a comment earlier about sometimes like you know we we um um you know, we don't know where to start or you know sometimes it feels difficult to get going and 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 how do you do how do you do and i i, I think about like you know we we get up every day we get out of bed um uh, those of us that are fortunate to, to you know to, to have that uh, ability why why not take advantage of it sometimes it's it's just, sometimes all it takes is putting on these uh you know your 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 runners or uh and 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 starting off with a walk before you can go for a run um but before you know it you know you're 3 miles into it 4 miles into it and you you finished the, an epic run and yeah. you have that wonderful feeling so everything starts from somewhere but it starts with accountability to yourself in terms of what you want to get done I love that advice. There's so much to unpack there because it is quite scary sometimes to be you and to yeah. be vulnerable and be your authentic self. I think for years I was trying to portray a version of Chris that I thought people wanted to hear, see and hear, you know, this stereotype of a person and it's, and it's exhausting <laughs> to yeah. do that. And I think it's like those lines that like slowly they become one because there is a part of you i'm not a psychologist but i believe i'm the same way i always try to i always try to visualize where i'd like to be Mm -hmm. so if i want to you know today is that friday night for you so you know you're already maybe visualizing that you're gonna have a beer later or whatever (laughs) you know that's just a crude example but you know we're we're visualizing ourselves at some end point um so how how do we make that reality um closer from the actions that we take in order to do that so inevitably you're taking actions to get you there mm-hmm. um so so sometimes when people think of being not themselves or somebody that they don't think you know sorry somebody that they they think that they should be maybe they are projecting in terms of how they want to be 
but they just need to align themselves in terms of how do they want to get there, right? And 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 as long as they're doing it with authenticity and, and accountability to themselves, then you, you're going to, then we're going to be able yeah, to I get agree. those. Yeah, I agree. That, that is one of the hardest things though. If anyone, it's just getting started seems to be the biggest challenge for most people because they end up talking themselves out of it. Yeah. And, uh, I was quite lucky that I realized early on with sports that the only way to get good at it is you have to start it and be terrible. <laughs> so no one, no one, like my wife would always say, oh, I'm not good at that. And I'm like, have you ever tried it? No. So how are you, how are you going to be good at it? Yeah. Right. Did you just become great? At, did you just become great? At, you know, over, and so a lot of people see the success, but they never see all of the work behind it and how terrible you were. It's like, I remember when I first started breakdancing, my older brother, and my and my mum and my all my family used to just laugh at me. Oh, Chris, you're terrible! And it was and it was even more it's embarrassing how bad I was. And I remember like years later, it would be, oh, do you know my brother's a dancer? My, my brother was a really good dancer. Have you seen him dance? <laughs> Have you seen him? He's performed with all these artists. So he's he's great. And it, it, it used to make me laugh. And I, I would remember those moments of everyone laughing at me and being so terrible. And then. Yeah. I think I had that early on when I started playing basketball and I remember having a conversation with myself going, wow, that's what it takes. I can do anything I want as long as I understand that I'm going to be terrible at it and there's a process I'm going to have to go through which takes time and I'm going to have to be, get a coach and, and learn from someone or something. And then I, that was really empowering. That's, I felt like I had a superpower from that moment onwards and every single sport that I, we that we tried or anything in, you know, in, in this, you know, for example, in HR leaders, I wanted to start this podcast, but I didn't know how to video edit. And I was like, cool, YouTube exists. Let me learn how to video edit. <laughs> and, and, and lo and behold, we have a podcast and, and a show. And it's just, once you know that and you overcome that initial fear of getting started, it's just so empowering just to be like, whatever I want to do. And, and you know, the, take the extreme situation of what you just described. Imagine putting yourself in a situation where you have to do it, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. Like you had to break dance in front of the crowd because you're on stage, or yeah. I had to do a podcast with you. You know, these um, the, the 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 one that I always get reminded of is people that do these channel crossings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they swim. Uh, from, yeah. You know, they they starting from point A. They have to get to point <laughs> B. You can't just walk off. You yeah. have to. You 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 got to get to the other side. So, that's crazy. Um, yeah, that's an extreme one. Yeah, <laughs> Although cool. normally don't they have a boat next to them just in case? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, but, but it, I mean, you can just take any point A to point. Yeah, B you're right. You're right. And you're you know you got the same thing. You have to get there. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that um, happens as an entrepreneur as well, right? So when uh, we our business kind of really went out of business because of the pandemic, we had no choice but to either we basically either the business is going to disappear because we've lost eight percent of revenue because we can't do physical events. We can either accepted that or completely reinvent a company which required all of us to reskill and to reinvent what we did. And everyone unanimously in the company was like, oh, because I was like, you know, do, do you want to furlough? We can furlough you. We have the furlough scheme from the government and we can wait it out. Or yeah. do we want to do that? And unanimously, everyone was like, no, <laughs> let's go and tackle that. And we had, that's an example where there was no choice. We have a basically, in, we hear innovate or die. And I used to you know, talk about a lot. We were literally, it, we experienced that for the first time in my career of we had to literally innovate or die, or there would not yeah. be a company. Um, and when you're faced with that, you know, we did that in less than a month to completely reshape the whole entire company, launch a new product, start generating revenue and if we would have had to do that in a, a, in a in a in an environment outside of COVID, probably wouldn't have happened. Yeah, it forced you to do that. Yeah, That's great. Well, listen, before I let you go, where can people grab a copy of the book and uh, also learn more about you and connect with you if they want to reach out? Yeah, so uh, we put together a great website. Uh, it's PaneetDillon.com. There's a lot of information on there. There's uh, information on the book. There's also some other uh, great articles of other things that. Um, we're doing in the community and, and uh, we also launched uh, torpedojournal.com which is, you can find that on on, on my website um, you can reach me at hello at uh, uh anybody that wants to follow up by email I always love uh, hearing feedback on the book and um, um, very accessible there's actually I think a tab on the website in case you uh, want to connect with me as well amazing well look thanks again for taking the time to join us and uh, I wish you all the best until we next week Hey, thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Really appreciate it.